Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 40K Fireside Podcast. I'm David Gaylor, and I'm joined by my good friend, Vic Vijay. Together, we discuss 40K in the meta from our perspective, along with events we've recently been to and those that have got coming up. So come on down to the fireside and listen. Welcome back to 40K Fireside. This is episode 35, and not only have you got me and the lovely David Gaylard, but you've also got Brian Seip with us today. Uh, Brian is a member of Team Ignite, and he's joined us today to kind of have a general discussion about the meta and potentially what direction the game could go in with a balance update that we've got coming pretty soon. Um, just a quick introduction. Now, Brian has already been on the podcast once before, but um, for those of you who don't know, Brian is a very accomplished 40K competitive player. He's currently sitting in sixth on the ITC ranking, so really, really up there. But he's also won a number of tournaments, including a Super Major at Leicester, um, a number of team events, including the Birmingham Teams event with, uh, with us, uh, with Ignite. And he also did incredibly well at the World Team Championships um, these past, a few weeks back, where he went undefeated, scoring the second highest score amongst all the players who attended, and helping Scotland achieve a very good ranking of 12th place. Uh, Brian, hello. Hey, thanks. I'm really you know, glad to be on here again. And like I said, we like to think of it as a joint sixth place with Germany. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, really happy with how we did this year. Yeah, and uh, Brian and I didn't play each other, but uh, New Zealand played Scotland in a pretty tense uh, round six, was it? I think round six, right? Um, yeah, New Zealand uh, playing for the draw there. five, I think. Yeah. Uh, round five, yeah, you're right, sorry. Um, yeah, th- that was a really good round as well, so super fun. That was great. All righty, what are we going to cover today? I guess yeah. we've got, we're in a bit of a lull, aren't we? We're sort of, it's the calm before the storm in some sense. Yeah. Uh, We've had the WTC, which was a huge influx of change for the game in terms of list innovation, list development, and a massive testing ground for really just how factions line up against each other. And then that is backdropped, obviously, against a pretty horrific meta for singles, I would say. Uh, I think it's the worst I've ever seen it uh, in my time of playing Warhammer. Um, so, yeah, I guess let's let's do a bit of a roundtable. Brian, uh, you've been playing... I guess the the bad boy in the middle right now, Aldari. Kind of, what is your what's your view of singles right now um, before the game has changed? Because we know the game's going to be changing in September. What's your view of like Aldari as it currently stands? I guess, and perhaps in relation to previous metas you might have been a part of. <laughs> um, what's my opinion on Aldari? Uh, I'm trying to decide <laughs> if I take my heel turn right now and say they're fine. Um, but I guess. Uh, I mean, they're, it's obviously it's it's very clearly the most powerful codex ever printed. Uh, I guess it's not technically a codex, but you know, most powerful rule set ever printed. Um, it has a combinations of I mean, everyone knows this, but combinations of of cheap units that are incredibly efficient at playing the way the missions and the way tenth edition plays. Incredibly devastating units in terms of damage, um, and you know, a sweetest uh, strats which are incredible. Not to mention, you know, having the best stratagem ever printed in the history of Warhammer. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I think uh, the Guild are, are pretty, uh, pretty desperately in need of being taken out behind the woodshed. Yeah, taken out behind the woodshed. I remember because um, obviously I played. I'm not going to hide it. I played Leviathan Tyranids, which I think were, I think probably in hindsight got a little bit more flack than they deserved, considering there were other. I think there were more broken things like Void Weavers. I think Admix Six Planes is a bit more broken. <laughs> Just the sheer uh, uninteractiveness of those games were a bit brutal. Um, and then uh, nine, you know, eighteen buggies was uh, really bad as well. Um, and then we've got Aldari here as well, and I think Aldari, from my opinion, sits quite hit a hidden shoulders above any of those lists I previously mentioned, right? Like, maybe that's just my opinion. I don't know. What do you think, Vic? Um, it's a really interesting one because I think these broken kind of units or codexes slash indexes, they get worse with time. So we had, uh, for example, Iron Hand sitting as a very strong faction for a very extended period of time. And people feel that pressure more and more as time goes on. You start to enjoy singles less innovation starts to dry up and people start to just wait for the next balance update. 
Mm. It's kind of where we are at the moment. There were some other times where we had emergency patches. So we had a little patch to Drakari. We had a little patch to Void Weavers quite quick. Um, with Eldar, I mean, it hasn't been out for a very long time, but I don't know if, if you guys agree. It feels like this has been going on for ages <laughs> since uh, 10th edition dropped. Um, but it actually hasn't been that long an amount of time. But mm. over this period of time, we've seen the play rate for Eldari increase. Mm -hmm. And we've seen the win rate stay consistently extremely high with the codex also, with the index also winning the majority of events. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so if yeah. we look, if we look at the Meta Monday, you know, and shout out to uh, JCM S85, um, who writes this, uh, there are only small events, but Aldari won 70% of those events. So there was no event larger than 50 players. Aldari won 70%, going 75% win rate without the mirror. And these stats, I'm very confident, would be even more egregious if there were big events, because you know it's it's no surprise that those events would be dominated more by Aldari uh, as well. So potentially even worse than that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned it well. We're in a bit of a slumber right now, uh, a Necron slumber, waiting to be reanimated, uh, some life being breathed into uh, into this one. So I thought maybe we should talk about the previous balance slate because I I know that. We uh, we're anticipating one before the LGT in September, and so Brian, I don't know if you can remember off the top of your head, but I can remember that there were a cha there was a change to Fate Dice and the Gene Stealer Cult Blips. I feel like those are the two most impactful ones. What what was your impression of how much that changed the meta? Like, did it have a big dent, or did, uh, were things basically the same? Um, so I think. There was a lot of optimism when those changes came out, especially for towards towards Eldar, um, where you know it's looked at as, well now your things aren't going to be kind of invincible in the early turns, and you have a shot at killing these things and kind of moving on. Um, and I think it quickly became apparent though that the fate dice mechanic just is fundamentally um, incredibly powerful, even if just using it once per turn or once per phase, excuse me, um, and Consequently, didn't have the impact I think that they were really hoping for. That coupled with some of the points changes uh, that accompanied it, um, and similarly with GSC, um, I think that you saw the blip change was uh, was was good. Um, I think that it was rather abusive to be able to string out your units um, across the entire board to make them immediately get back in the fight, um, and they changed it for those who aren't aren't familiar with to just having to be relatively close to your blip. I forget, it's like six or three inches or something. Hmm. Um, and uh, the problem, th that solved one aspect of GSC, but it didn't solve other ones. Other ones being just the sheer damage that they can they can put out. And I think that this is where we start to run into some of the problems. And we've seen this with some armies before. Um, you know, Broken armies historically have all kinds of different issues associated with them. I think you look at something like... Uh, uh, Drukari, and it was everything was was priced really really too cheap, and you had too many assets, and you were able to play this trading game without ever your opponent ever having a chance to keep up. Which I think is some aspects kind of the some of that that theme runs through with Eldar, but I think that the large it's, they're more akin to I think Speedwog, in this in the sense of they just deal an incredible amount of damage, and your opponent no matter how well they're trying to play. Um, will, will almost always struggle to play um, in in that kind of a game where your opponent can just table you again and again and again every mm. single turn. Survive to five was my advice uh, <laughs> playing against Saldari at the WTC. <laughs> just try and survive to five, which was difficult if your opponent was good. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you're right. I think the Gene Steel Cult one hit uh, a little bit, well, had more of an impact than the Aldari one. Uh, I felt like some of the Gene Steel Cult games actually became winnable. Um, because they didn't have as much primary control as they otherwise would uh, with you know with stringing out so close to objectives to where they could just move and then be on them as well. Um, yeah, the race night went up 100 points as well, I suppose. Uh, Vic, any uh, any thoughts on you know did that really change much? Was it a bit weak handed? I I think it was good that they were quite proactive with it and they did hit some of the correct areas. I think they just need a little bit more time because the um, Eldari index, like Brian rightly said, like the Drukari Codex, was is, is widely undercosted. So mm -hmm. there's going to be either one of two things happen. 
Uh, one is that we're going to have um, kind of stages of nerfs where people just keep moving on to different and different builds, which are all equally or almost as strong as the previous one. So Eldar continue to dominate. Or they go for either very wide points increases. So they basically take every unit and make it more expensive. I think that would be a very effective way of dealing with this. Or they really attack either core game rules or Eldar's stratagems and detachment abilities and things and tone tone the entire army down what i think could easily happen is that they go for targeted nerfs to individual units which i don't think is going to be enough here mm. Mm, interesting that's a teaser for part two of vicky's down the game <laughs> <laughs> yes um yeah so there's a whole suite of changes that obviously uh obviously need to get changed here as well um so you know game to summarize is in a pretty terrible state you only really feel like i think you have a shot if you're playing one of those one or two armies right um and i think the problem is that once as these aldari players also have gotten much more practice that that gsc matchup becomes much more comfortable for them as well mm -hmm. which is you know just really tough because the, the players in a singles perspective are so good at locking you out of the game and winning by 15 points uh if they really want with very little risk probably or just tabling you when they can which is you know 60 percent of the time probably <laughs> yeah um, and, uh, and tabling is a good good strategy for singles too don't get me wrong <laughs> i would say that the game is still fairly interesting if you exclude eldar like if you pretend that they don't exist which is something you can do in a team event for example mm -hmm. actually the game is quite engaging interesting and quite challenging with a lot of room for innovation because the indexes themselves i feel you know while they may not be perfectly balanced they're actually written with a fair bit of flavor and also with a bit of depth which is quite impressive considering they're only indexes with a single detachment. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm quite positive that if they can, you know, I wouldn't mind over nerfing Eldar here. I, I am an Eldar player by like by nature, but I would not mind if they, they over nerfed it a little bit just to give us a chance to, you know, search for some of the cooler combos in Eldar to really try and put everything together and create a higher skill army. Um, because the Eldar index does have depth. It's just, slightly you know not slightly is grossly overpowered and they're cool models as well which is awesome uh, i think you'd find uh like you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who really enjoys playing eldar that wouldn't want them to be I, in what I, what i think they were in a good spot at the end of ninth where it was it was an army which if you had a skilled pilot could could perform quite well mm -hmm. um but if you didn't it would kind of collapse like a house of cards um which is kind of historically what Eldar is supposed to be right um and I think that you know they're very clearly not that right now, and ideally that's where they would get nerfed to. Uh, but that's a very difficult target to hit. So I, I do agree with Vic. If you're going to go any direction, you know, make them make them too um, like put them in too too far down on, in the ground. <laughs> um, don't don't try and do delicate changes and try and get it just right. I'd rather they go too far and then ease off with the next next patch. Um, give other armies a chance to explore. Give up people, with, as I've said, with an Eldar Codex a chance to kind of dig around. The Codex is super deep, so I'd be very surprised if there isn't something that makes it so it's at least playing games and being competitive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as long as they keep Phantasm as it is, it, it, it will always be a competitive index. You, any units, you, the units don't even have to shoot guns. You can you can play the movement tricks and try and win the game that way. Yeah, and that is, I guess, one of the things that I've been thinking about when I'm trying to plan for changes in LGT is if Eldar do get put, um, get heavily nerfed um, to the point where they're borderline unplayable, the core of the army is still incredibly fast moving um, troops that are probably the best army in the game at playing the mission. Mm -hmm. And that fun, that's not going to change That's with any of these change, or these nerfs. So, you know, fundamentally there's always going to be a foundation that, that just works really well. Mm. I just want to touch on one thing though. Speaking of playing uh, different armies and, you know, we talked about 10th edition Obviously, we had an episode where uh, perhaps I was quite harsh about 10th edition. Uh, I've been playing probably not the greatest armies in the game. And yeah, it does feel like there is there is game to play in 10th edition. The, the, the balance between tactical and fixed is still reasonably interesting. Uh, but I do sometimes feel like tactical, the way in order which you draw cards can have quite a big impact on games, especially if they're close games. I think singles probably exacerbates that a little bit there as well. But Vic or Brian, open question. Either of you guys been playing other armies, messing around with other stuff, you know, 
it's not like kind of the top armies in the game. And, you know, are you finding the games kind of engaging and enjoying, you know, the benchmark here being ninth edition to some degrees, right? I'll start with Brian. Uh, yeah, I would. So one of the things that prepping for WTC um, and it did was I played a lot of games with a lot of different armies um, as we were as, as a team, we were testing and developing um, a game plan. Um, and over the course of that process, um, I started to enjoy 10th edition more and, and more. And I, th I think that I'm at a stage where from the context of the game itself, I I've never enjoyed 10th edition more. Um, you know, it's, it's just going up. I think the, I think the actual edition is really good. There's some flaws and some things that need to be corrected, but I'm, I'm very optimistic that games workshop is rapidly trying to kind of address those. And it's sometimes easy to forget that the game's only been out for two months. Hmm. Um, but um, I do think, you know, when you're playing with armies, like, for example, I was doing a lot of testing with Tau or Custodes or um, beginning to get my feet with some other armies, too. Um, I I found the the games interesting, engaging. You know, everyone has a shot at, at, at winning that game. Um, so, yeah, definitely. Hmm. Vic? So one thing I'm really interested and excited to see is what they do with the bottom power level factions so okay fine i i've been avoiding eldar but in in my mind i'm thinking you know what if they buff sisters a little bit you know what if the points go down even more or they add another army-wide rule to them that actually brings them to be viable because that army is not far off being a good army if it just gains one more layer of rules or you just get too much stuff for the points. And the, the other one, which I think is extremely likely to potentially become a good army is um, Tau. I think Tau are on the cusp of already being good enough to compete. And the win rate is extremely low relative to the power level of the faction. I think mm. if, if you have a skilled pilot who's built an optimized list that they've thought about and they've practiced with, I think you can get decent results with Tau. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to take much for you to just get a little bit more in your army. And suddenly you're you're actually competing to win events. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I, I'd keep a close eye on Tau and see how that one ends up. Um, but yeah. How about you, Dave? Yeah, because I guess Tau was that seventh, eighth pick at, at, for, for many WTC teams, right? Or for a few. Uh, and then we also had, I guess, Knights were sort of around that region, right? Uh, and then Grey Knights, I think, are, are one where, you know, you've got some room there to play. I think if they get some points drops, they have what seem to be some of the best army rules in the game outside of Eldari, of course. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, you know, picking up all your army basically every turn is pretty it's pretty sick, all the, all the teleporting and the movement. Uh, but they just lack a bit of damage and are very expensive as well. So I think, yeah, I think that's I have, what for. Grey Knights have some of the most uh, unfair rules, if you will, um, of any faction uh, that's currently, I think, existing. Um, but you know they're countered by not everything being incredibly expensive. So just mm. some, some point reductions. I think you're going to find that army is really interesting. Yeah, exactly. I, I guess I've been I've pretty much played every army at this point. Uh, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, I've pretty much played every army at this point, and it has been a good apart from GSC. If I've played against that enough, that's for sure. Uh, and it has been a pretty dynamic game under the surface of those uh, those two armies. Uh, but I think that if we kind of only look at those two armies to nerf, then there's still going to be quite a big difference between uh, some existing armies already there as well. So I hope that the bottom gets brought up this time as well. But I'm, I'm once again moving on to the second half of the episode. But I guess that kind of covers it, doesn't it? We, to summarize, to, to some extent, the balanced data site didn't really have that much of an impact on moving those top two armies. I think the current state of the game shows that if kind of, I guess, Leviathan Nids was any indicator of dominance, uh, that they will probably get nerfed into the ground. Uh, and this heads up, I don't really know, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but Leviathan Nids definitely got put in the naughty corner. Uh, so uh, I think GSC and Aldari, oh, Aldari certainly are more dominant than, than that. Uh, so I would expect a heavy hand on that. Um, otherwise, the state of the game aside from those two factions it's, it's quite good it's quite competitive i do worry about some of the missions there's quite a bit of discrepancy in the ability to score on some of the missions and some of the missions are quite poorly designed i think from a play perspective they you know the the hockey puck one or the ritual for example it's not that i don't mind playing them but it's just i feel like they are 
they, they had the right intention for those missions, but the way that they play out once you practice them is quite monotonous and uh, can be very daft or kind of first turn impactful as well. So we'll see what happens with that. But yeah, if, if I haven't missed anything, we'll uh, click it over to part two. Cut to some jazz where we're going to be talking about the meat and potatoes here. Basically, our wish list of what we think we, well, what we would love to see in the game, uh, the general meta, if that were to be incorporated, and uh, talking about the, maybe the new uh, Tyranid stuff and uh, the LGT meta that we're going to be anticipating going up. So we'll catch you guys in about 25 seconds. Welcome back for part two. So we're going to be going through, I think let's start off by talking about where we think the general meta is, what we think the strongest factions are. I mean, this is, you can see this content everywhere, but just briefly to help guide us through kind of what we want to do in our kind of um, fireside balanced data sheet. Uh, <laughs> so Brian, what do you think? What, what's sitting at the top there? I mean, let's ignore Eldar and GSC. Give me, give me the stuff below that. Uh, so after you know those the two boogeymen, I think I think it starts to drop into factions such as Custodes, um, Thousand Sons. Um, you might look at something like Death Watch potentially, but mm -hmm. I think that that's more on specific kind of units or builds potentially. Um, but I, I, I think uh... those are kind of the big ones. Yeah, yeah, potentially uh, Deathwing Knights, maybe. Yeah, I could also see Necrons um, potentially being there. Um, yep. uh, the concern I have about something like Necrons is not necessarily that they're too powerful, but they're obviously an incredibly resilient army, um, and I wonder how much of their win rate is being kept in check by the sheer damage of the top two factions. Yep. Um, and and if that gets adjusted, is are we going to see a problem? Maybe Chaos Knights? I've, I've been quite impressed by Chaos Dave Knights. In that? Yeah, like Chaos Knights I think you could throw in there. Maybe yeah. 14 or 15 armages. And then maybe uh, Imperial Knights I think um, have done quite well. Oh, Votan, obviously. Votan's up there. <laughs> um, so I have a little bit of an open question here, Dave, for you. You know, let's say, and I hear a lot of people saying this, but let's say that they do completely nerf GSC and Eldar to the ground. And they don't do any other changes to the game. It's just those two factions are dead. They remove their band. Hmm. How do you think the state of the matter will sit following that? Do you think it will be in a good enough place? Or do you think something will still be broken? This is the perfect opportunity to do a reverse Vic right now. Because whenever I ask Vic a question like this, he inevitably <laughs> something like, it's really interesting and that's a tough question. Because <laughs> what you exactly asked me is not the issue. It's the surrounding rule component. And <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and that's what I'm going to answer. Because GSC and Aldari are obviously a problem. But it's also the rules which support them, which are a big problem as well. So I think devastating mm -hmm. words is a huge problem with the game. Uh, I don't think that you're going to... There is no argument that devastating wounds should continue to function as it currently does, in my opinion. I think it's completely busted. It's a dumb mechanic. It makes the haves and have nots just massive. You know, you've got some profiles that are, you know, oh, devastating wounds, you know. Oh, and I can reroll with it. Okay, great. <laughs> or I can force a six. Great. Or I just get tons of shots. Fantastic. Oh, the moments. Fantastic. Um, so I think that's massive. And to be honest with you, armies that are good against devastating wounds or have devastating wounds, I think would probably just naturally sink right, uh, will float right to the top after that. So. If you were just to curtail only Eldari and GSC, uh, barring the changes above, I think T Suns are going to be a cut above pretty much everything, uh, and that's I think pretty fair to say. I think between Custodes, Deathwing Knights, Necrons, a couple of uh, Knight builds, and maybe Death Watch, you've got and you could. I mean, I don't want to say this, but you could maybe argue Tyranids up there. Um, I think, or and then Chaos Space Marines, I think it's definitely in there too, actually. I think you've got a very even mix. So I'm just going to, I'm going to flip the question on its head. And I'm going to say, if you take out 
TSUN's GSC and Aldari, you're left with Custodes, CSM, Marines in general, Necrons, CK, IK, and I think that's a pretty close uh, it's a pretty close basket, I think, between those you know five or six factions right there with no other changes, um, Dev Wounds being the same thing. What are your thoughts? So I'm going to counter your counter. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> by, by making a point here that I think extremely strong or broken factions distort a meta around those particular factions. And if you take, for example, T-Suns, I think T-Suns are a perfect example of this. T-Suns sit in a place where their mortal wound output is ideal into the kind of units that Eldari are taking. Eldari inherently doesn't have mortal wound protection, and neither does GSC. But if you look at the factions below it, let's take other T-Suns, they get a 4-up feel no pain against psychic attacks. You take Necrons, they have access to a 4-up feel no pain against psychic attacks. Um, you take, uh, what, what was I just using? CSM. Um, and you can kind of sub in demons and get a three up feel no pain from any of the corn units. Um, you can get dark angels and get a four up feel no pain against mortal wounds. So, you know, if Eldar and GSC don't exist, then suddenly you have freedom to tailor for a new meta, which involves factions that aren't as strong as the previously broken ones. And T Suns would fall, I think, within that level where you could tailor your list with just a couple of things to mute their output and help you to win a game that you aren't actually considering at the moment because they're not that important in the meta. Uh, I would agree in 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 uh, in principle here, but um, I suspect that T Suns are definitely an army that's fast enough to kill whatever tech pieces you bring. Uh, <laughs> would be my my hesitation in that one, but I do agree in general that unlike Aldari. You've got options that are <laughs> built into armies that you can actually directly impact the game with, right? Like you can take, you know, four up feel no pain against or or flesh hounds or something like that, right? Like, okay, that directly impacts the board state. And the more that you have of those, the better chance you've got of winning here, right? Whereas Aldari, it's kind of like, well, I'm just gonna try and take, I don't know, mm -hmm. generically tanky thing or random jank thing that's terrible against every matchup apart from maybe killing a Wraith Knight, right? So yeah, there's there's more solutions to armies like Thousand Suns, for example. Um but I think they would still be still be quite good. I mean, that, that codex is quite deep as well. Brian, bring you in here. What are you? Uh, you've just been listening away. So, what are, what are your thoughts on it? I guess maybe <laughs> let, let me ask you to come in and say, if what is your opinion on if we drop Eldari, GSC, and T Suns, we'd just be left with Custody, CSM, Generic Marines, Necrons, Imperial Knights, Chaos Knights. Kind of, how, what's your what would be your vibe on that? If I just removed all three of those factions from the game, the the two the, the three ones that I mentioned, Aldari, GSC, and Tizan. I I actually think you're forgetting a really important faction right now, which is going to step into the gap filled by GSC and um, GSC and Aldar quite well, and that's Orcs. Mm -hmm. um, sure. I think Orcs are right on the edge of uh, being good enough already, um, just from sheer activation lock, um, their mobility, their ability to put high OC on lots of objectives. And I think that that's going to become even harder when these top factions go away. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I, I think that I agree that a lot of the armies seem really close. Um, I think that Thousand Suns are probably a bit, probably going to come to the top of the heap. I do think you can, as Vic said, you can tailor a bit around them. Um, some armies, I should phrase, can tailor a bit around them, but some of the fundamental rules that Thousand Suns have are just going to be universally good at all times. You know, mm -hmm. turn off the armor save of a unit is just good. Um, that's not really something which depends on the matchup or you can really tech against. You get the Fiona Pains and stuff, but it doesn't help you against flamethrowers and, st and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Temporal Surge moving in the shooting phase is very strong as well. Exactly. Do I mean, double moving is, is... Anytime you can... The more you can move in Warhammer 40k, the better an army is. And if you can do it in multiple phases, that's incredibly powerful, right? So um, that's not that's not going to change either. But um, does, I don't think they're going to come up as the new boogeyman. I think that Thousand Suns are also probably one of the most skill-intensive armies to play, probably the most skill-intensive army to play right now, um, just from all the resources you have to manage and uh, and and the fact that they are at their core. Just space marine bodies, um, and mm -hmm. space marine bodies die, especially in this less lethal edition. Um, so, <laughs> I think uh, 
I, I think the combination of of it being a skill intensive army um, and it being one that you can kind of tech into might warp the meta a bit where people you see a lot more thousand suns but then people might overreact to that um, mm -hmm. because I think the army gains a lot of percentage points uh, with with the good pilot mm -hmm. um, and I think a good pilot is probably going to be winning games regardless of those tech pieces to mm -hmm. most matchups which speaks to its raw power level you would argue right yeah i think t suns are going to be extremely powerful but mm. um and and yeah especially i think after this balance update there's a chance the t suns may go under the radar a little bit potentially mm -hmm. um i think they sit very well into a meta where they can play against most things as mm -hmm. much as people can bring tech pieces for them they can bring tech pieces for most of the things that other people mm -hmm. have as well so, so correct me if i'm wrong but i'm pretty sure you just counted yourself right yeah, I counted the counter with the counter. So, um, <laughs> uh, but I do have a question for Brian because I think this is the key thing and and kind of the the crux of the issue GW have here, which is what is the correct and most elegant changes that they could make to Eldari? And I kind of want to pass this over to you, Brian. If you have any ideas of an approach that you would take if you were GW for purely dealing with Eldari. Um. I think there are a couple fundamental 10th edition rules that need to be looked at, which when looked at will dramatically curb Eldar's potency. Um, the leading one of which is, is devastating wounds. Um, I think that a lot of times people will find that their the ability for a, for a weapon like a D cannon to be simultaneously good against elite infantry and heavy vehicles and against hordes, uh, makes it too ubiquitous, and you don't have to design elements into your list that can deal with multiple types of threats. You can just overload on that particular um, that particular weapon. Um, so that and that's a that's a fundamental flaw of devastating wounds. So if they were to address that in some kind of a way, um, that would that would curb and, and dramatically change how Eldar builds because you couldn't just spam devastating wound weapons and and be able to deal with ev everything that your opponent could throw at you. Um, I think that uh, it's important that some of the speed elements in Eldar get addressed. Um, and I think that's best done through a combination of points and then taking a hard look at Phantasm. So so some units are, are criminally underpriced, such as Shatter Spectres and Warp Spiders. Um, and uh, then you have <laughs> something like Phantasm, which... I think the best way to address Phantasm, um, there's been a lot of, you know, you can make it 2 CP, you could make it um, so it's once per game. Uh, I think the best way to address Phantasm is to change the timing on it. You'd, you'd make it so it happens mm -hmm. at the beginning of the movement phase um, yeah. or something along those lines um, so that you don't have all the information your opponent uh, has, has none. Uh, it still has a lot of value there, uh, but it doesn't have the same kind of game-breaking effect that it has right now, where you get to fix all your mistakes for free for one CP. There's nothing more frustrating when... Yeah, cause so so I'm going to jump in, because that change is brilliant, because it hits Deep Strike. Because, the I mean, I met, like there's nothing more frustrating when playing as Eldar, when you've got Deep Strike components in your army. It's like, well, I need to roll a 9. It's like, well, you could just Phantasm away and immediately invalidate that without a problem. Or, you know, you're setting up a multi-charge, you can try to pin a unit... And you're like, okay, you could phantasm here, you could phantasm there, and then you're just like, oh, you just phantasm right there, and then yeah, it's a it's a ten for all my guys. You know, you just understand, Dave. They were never there in the first place. They were just <laughs> illusions. Illusions. <laughs> yeah. Um, what would be the if if for example, Brian, Dev Wounds got changed? Uh, what would be the and phantasm got made the first kind of turn of the game? What would be the rough amount of points you would de decrease, like, or allow Aldari books to play with at the moment? Are we talking like 1,500 <laughs> points or 1,600? Or do you think it needs to go up 20%? Uh, I think that it's it's hard to say that they should all be, everything should be raised. Because um, I think there are a lot of components which haven't been played yet. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things which I think aren't being played because they're just not as nearly as good as everything else. For example, uh, the nine-man Windrider unit with a Farseer, and you stick a Warlock in there, um, and that unit slaps, right? It's incredibly good, um, but it's just not nearly good enough because you can get way more damage out of other other sources, so nobody's really playing it. Hmm. Um, so 
units like that do need to go up as well, or else you have this pivot, you know, kind of playing whack-a-mole until suddenly they're out of stuff. But there is a point where Eldar just stop having stuff. For example, when they start hitting things like Howling Banshees, which are just not good, um, which is unfortunate because I have five beautifully painted ones. Um, <laughs> and so I, th I think that um, as, a, as a, like a general um, kind of context-free, I would say at least 1,500 points, or at, at, at minimum, you have to make it so that you are nerfing a 2,000-point army down to 1,500 points, I think. 1,500? Um, especially when you're looking at the resources you currently have. That's huge. Yeah. Oh. Like, I think it needs to be about a 20, oh, average about a 25% uh, decrease across the, or increase across everything. Now, I expect that would be distributed between things that are already good and yeah. things that, um, you know, are, are one waiting in the wings to to become good yeah um but i i think that even even if i mean you take so for example my army i played at wtc um if you were to take that army and you just take out the wraith knight it's still an incredibly powerful army that beats most things it plays against hmm. um, yeah. at least i think it is um and and that's basically 1500 points so you know it's it's arguable that it's not even enough points to try and change it so uh, but hopefully that, with the mechanical changes, will uh, w that we hope are coming, will help to uh, to kind of even the playing field enough to where Eldar is as kind of that sweet spot of playable, but but skill yeah. intensive. Yeah, and um, fifteen hundred points is a lot uh, a lot lower than I thought you were going to say actually, uh, which just goes to show. Uh, Brian, for the record, is the second highest scoring player at WTC uh, playing Eldari, um, so <laughs> I'm going to call him one of the resident experts here. Um, uh, one thing we've a couple of things we've got to mention, which just goes to show how how diverse and strong this book is. Uh, Incarn, you know, mega powerful, uh, just extremely frustrating to play against. The fact that it can charge after you kill something is just, uh, you know, <laughs> it's ludicrously strong. Uh, and then you've got the Night Spinner as well. Night. The thing I don't like about the Night Spinner is that um, if it just minus two to move, it would be it would be a fine unit. Like you would still play it. Because it's got twin link, devastating wounds, uh, but it stops advances as well, which just shuts off so many armies. You know, so many armies, uh, melee in particular, might rely on a unit to advance and charge, for example. Uh, and a knight spinner can just boom, shut that off uh, immediately. And typically, you might have one of those in your army, right? So <laughs> the knight spinner, I find it incredibly frustrating. And kind the, of the spinner, the spinner is incredibly um, oppressive. I think. Um... But I think I think it's important to be careful because I think the spinner's almost actually, in, in my opinion at least, at a at a, a good spot where you don't really want to take multiples, but you want to take one because you'd like to have the effect and maybe a tiny bit of indirect. And I think that's exactly where you want indirect to be. You want like just just a little bit of a sprinkling of it to have an effect throughout the game, but but not so much that it becomes what the game is about. Um, and I think that the spinner it definitely should probably go up in points, but I think it's almost it's almost at that point now where it's it's at a good spot. But um, what if we just keep it at the same points and remove the cannot advance clause from it? Minus just, two I, would, I would I wouldn't take it. Okay. Uh, I I all actually think there's a bit of an issue with the night spinner and the uh, warp spiders with their monofilament weapons having devastating wounds. Mm. I think they they probably got the um, the wrong keyword added to that. They could have done something else, you know. It it could have been like lethal hits or something, uh, you know. Oh, yeah, something yeah. like that, you know. Yeah. Um, just okay. So uh, yeah. So uh, there's there's multiple problems across this army, obviously, and as we all kind of know, isn't it? I'd say there's an issue though. You've highlighted a really key issue, which is that the Yin Khan has rules issues, and mm. stuff like the Night Spinner has points issues. Hmm. Um, and it, it, it's actually really fascinating how they're going to be able to correct that. Because if they do not like give the Yin Khan, they can't charge on the turn they teleport, which is an extremely elegant fix to the Yin Khan. Um, then, you know, the Yin Khan's still extremely oppressive unless they yep. massively increase the points. Yeah, I and... mean, you, at least you've got some potential of playing around it at that point, right? Like the old Yin Khan, you couldn't charge after you killed a unit, right? And that was after you teleport. People... Yeah, after you teleport, sorry, uh, which is when you kill a unit. Um, which is great, right? And people still played it. Like it was a fun, flavorful thing where you needed to. Make yeah, but sure you, you could also uh, you could also teleport multiple times in a phase, which was an important distinction. But you, you also could couldn't right. teleport if you couldn't fit your model. Whereas now you just move to the nearest possible point outside of engagement range. Sure. That that whole set of rules is very poorly written in terms of balance. <laughs> yeah, uh... I think that's the problem you run into, right? Is is 
is if you don't if you don't go into fundamental changes with the how the some units work and how some aspects of the game are played um then you run the risk of and you only pull on the points lever then you run the risk of either completely missing a mark too low or completely missing a mark too high where it never gets either never gets played or always gets played um so kind of coming at it from both ends i think is important the but absolutely a... genius thing they could do is just scrap the eldari index and rewrite it that all oh, can you imagine no well <laughs> well the problem here is that from a risk mitigation perspective you there's much more downside to having a model be too strong i think um so i would rather them take a heavy hand i think uh me personally i mean i certainly I, think everybody my, myself included having painted this Eldar army in the lead up to wc much of my frustration um would like to see Eldar over tuned down um like you know to the point where they they are as as people are want to say you know put in the ground um unplayable and then have the next balance data slate start to ease off that and try and bring them back into the spotlight rather than um have them try and try and nail it and miss and end up being still too powerful right you know i don't want to play against elder every single round i want to play against elder only when i play and Vic in the finals yeah. <laughs> and uh <laughs> let's move on to GSC in a second there's one point i wanted to make which is that if you reduce the power level of one faction to unplayability you know quote unquote unplayability which it doesn't actually exist uh you're only affecting one faction whereas if you make something so strong it's broken you're affecting everyone's ability to enjoy the game right because that's going to be very dominant at tournaments uh, it's going to be very oppressive. You're going to have to design your list in mind with that one particular list uh, or faction involved. But Aldari, 1,500 points, Phantasm rework, Incarn rework, Night Spinner, a little bit of rework, I think. Uh, Avatar of Kane is probably still too strong as well. It's current points, uh, which just goes to show you really, doesn't it? Uh, Wraith Knight. Uh, Titanic, I think, is something we missed as well, is that I think Titanic needs some kind of rework. It's just the most frustrating thing to play against as well. Um, yeah. Go back to ninth edition on that one. <laughs> um, GSC, Brian Vic, uh, anything? I mean, I feel like GSC are not that far away from a um, from being in the right place. I think if you nerfed demolition charges to just be D six shots, not D six plus three blast, I actually think GSC would be in an all right. Like they would just be strong. They are an absolutely stupid army. Like <laughs> I, it's it's not even that they're too strong or whatever. Fine, from a balanced perspective, there are ways of dealing with them. But I just think it's absolutely ridiculous, like, weapon design on them. Why do they do so much damage off these guys throwing the bomb things? Uh, it, it just makes no sense that they hit harder than anything else in the game. Um, and it just frustrates me because, like, the army is just so annoying to play against. And so weirdly balanced. Um, I don't know, Brian, what do you think? Um... <laughs> <laughs> So GSC, I think, have um, an issue where they, you don't have uh, the ability to play other aspects of the army because certain things are just so tuned. Those being the bomb squad, those being the, the neophyte squad. Um, so I actually think that some of the things that need to change are just some very small mechanical changes um, that would actually open up play styles significantly so for example if the nexus wasn't allowed to um allow two units to do a three inch deep strike um then and in the same turn then that would make playing bomb squads like have your army be four to five bomb squads be significantly worse because yeah. uh, or at least play very differently you have to start playing with uh, rapid ingresses and and actually you know playing a game where you don't get to have all the agency in your own movement phase I think um, the sab the saboteur has got to be on the chopping block there as well, right? For fifty five points, that model is a great. He's he's good. good. Uh, he's real good. Um, although my opponents always seem to roll ones when they try and use them <laughs> against me, probably because I'm just you know tiptoeing around those bombs. Oh, um, speaking about the saboteur, wait, what, like one tiny second back to Eldar. Can they please triple the points on the Autark way, way Leaper? Oh yeah, Th that Very that fun. unit is outrageous. Yeah, 80 point loan op, as good in combat, plus one CP is, uh, I think he's the cheapest plus one CP every turn in the game CP. almost, right? Yeah, Brain he might be the cheapest in the game. game and plus one CP. Yeah, um, it just goes to show you. inch moving probably, assault weapons. Yeah, you could probably play him without the plus one CP ability and like, it would still be, you know, 
okay, it's a bit fringe, yeah. but like he would still be playable. <laughs> uh, which some armies pay 130 points or 110 points on a dead character almost just for that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think GSC are that far off actually. I, I do agree that they have. I, I it sucks because uh, I think Games Workshop took a really innovative approach to maybe trying to design an army that functions very differently from the rest of the way the game plays. And so I think they deserve a lot of props there in, in pushing the design space because I don't think we should get into a space where we always blast Games Workshop for not pushing the envelope. But it needs to be said that perhaps this theme of things constantly reoccurring and whatnot is quite bad from not only an administrative perspective of uh, playing the army, but also as an opponent, it's confusing what is where and you spend a lot of time just figuring that out. And it, I think it just creates an inherent kind of distrust of is your opponent actually playing it correctly, et cetera, just because of the way that you need to keep track of everything. Um, yeah, I think so. And I think that some of the unanswered FAQ questions mm -hmm. um, that radically change GSC's power level need to be answered by Games Workshop. For example, when you respawn, do you get bombs? Are you able to resurrect models when they're killed in Overwatch? Yes. If the answer to those questions are no, GSC becomes significantly more reasonable. Shout out to WTC for doing the right thing. Um, but then if, say, they're not, um, then uh, GSC become one of those powerful, even more powerful than they currently are against uh, an oppressive. Um, and that can, be, that can be really challenging. Yeah, for reference here, uh, the UKTC currently rules that you can respawn and shoot demolition charges. You can also respawn after the uh, Overwatch period of the movement phase, which is just uh, perhaps rules is written. That's how it is, but that, I mean, very yeah. sad. Yeah, that's uh, incredibly strong. It, what it effectively means, guys, is that you can your opponent can rapid ingress a, a unit, and then in their turn advance and in, into you, and then you can Overwatch it, and then they just respawn after your Overwatch with the. I don't know, three demolition charges they need to kill your squad, uh, which is yeah. really tough to play around. I, I, do, I, do, I, I do hope the uh, UKTC step up their game with the, yeah. uh, the FAQ because they were actually like right at the, the peak of picking the right balance between raw and read as intended in yeah. the last edition until we got to the Yin Khan phase and things at the end of the edition where it started slipping and getting progressively worse. So if, yeah. uh, I, hope, I hope they don't go down the route of Kind of delegitimizing their event because the FAQs aren't done to a high enough standard. Yeah, and I think WTC is the gold uh, does set the gold standard for the uh, for the time being at least. I'm not saying that it can't be surpassed, but I definitely think that the general competitive player base would have no qualms with taking the entirety of the WTC FAQ and implementing that, barring oh, the, the charge in the wall. I think that's perfectly. If you want to make a decision on that, you know. That's that's a fundamentally that changes the way the game plays quite a lot, uh, but the general FAQ for how army rules interactions happen, I think the WTC nails it on the head. But even that's not fleshed out. Um, is Doombolt an attack, a ranged attack? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but that's a good segue because uh, T Suns. Um, I feel like I'm going to chat about this one, but obviously let's nerf them to the ground. No, no, I think T Suns are in a they're in a great they're in a good spot. Because they, they're quite flavorful. Uh, mm. You know, Magnus is an awesome model. Um, and, and it's cool to see big models on the on the battlefield, right? Like, you want to play games with like, models like Magnus are, you know, legitimately good. Um, but I think there's a couple of things that kind of push them over the edge. And I've only played one game of them. I've played against them quite a bit at this point. I think Temporal Surge not being able to be overwatched is um, potentially a little bit too strong. I think if you just added the clause, you know, this model was eligible to be overwatched. I think that wouldn't be, you know, that wouldn't be game breaking. You would just have to think about it a bit more because it just it, it layers in a level of uninteractivity there. Um, I, they need a lot of clarifications on the FAQs, uh, specifically around Doom Bolt, for example, uh, and psychic attacks in general. Devastating wounds, I think, you know, if we get some broad change to devastating wounds, I think that'll help tone them down a little bit. Uh, and then I think yeah that i think they're not too far off that maybe a few like maybe just like they're playing with 1925 points equivalent after that perhaps um and and that's kind of all i would i would really do to them at that point i think they're a, they are a strong army but they i think they should always be strong armies um but i don't think they're at the point where we need to be over drastic about them I don't know, Vic. Was that worse than so, you expected or more generous? I, I actually think there's quite a few very elegant fixes for mm -hmm. T Suns. And probably the one that I would go for is it's quite it's quite a heavy nerf, but it it would probably bring them to being still flavorful, but a little bit more balanced with some of the tricks that they can perform. 
So I think in the previous codex, any cabal rituals that you did had quite a few limitations. You could only do one per cycle, et cetera, mm. et cetera. In this one, um, a lot of people just assumed it was the same, but actually if you read through it, any psyker can uh, do as many cabal rituals as they want. The yep. only limitation is that you can only do each cabal ritual once mm. um, in a phase. Um, so what that means is that you can have like one character go around and that character can, you know, doom bolt, do get a free reroll, um, move again, and then you can make the same model move again. And um, I, I think the restriction that you could add is that each Psyker unit can only be affected by a Cabal Ritual once and can only use a Cabal Ritual once. Hmm. Um, and I think that would immediately remove a lot of the very over-the-top combos that you can pull off while still making it make sense because it doesn't make sense that one character is doing five cabal rituals in a phase. Mm. Yeah, previously you would have to take the arrogance of Aeon's Warlord trait to be able to do two cabal rituals on, on one, one unit, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the armor save, I, that's a pretty controversial one, I think, right? I think it is a bit too strong, right? It's, it I'm certainly fine doesn't with feel it, great. To be honest. Really? I, I think it's actually all right because a lot of these in, it require quite a bit of investment in resources. But the problem is when the threat range is too high by being able to temporal surge a unit a couple of times, it, it opens up a lot of kind of very unhealthy combinations there. Actually, the combo to A, bring your unit in range to do damage on these relatively short range weapons and then turn off armor saves, which is nine cabal points, is actually a bit of a complicated combo to get off in the right place. It helps your damage output in certain areas. And in a lot of situations, it doesn't actually make much difference. Um, but so, the, the primary offender for this is, sorry, is, is Magnus, right? So Magnus moves 16, 24 inch range. That's 40 inch threat range. Your Cabal Ritual is 18 inch range, which you can just chuck some random guy to do. Like, is is the investment that large? Because it, it just happens every single game, almost every turn from my experience of playing against it. Yeah, I mean, the investment is large. You have to spend a lot of points on Magnus to do this. Um, the thing is that you get so much freedom to do whatever you want. Magnus is dipping around the corner. He's casting Doom Bolt. He's getting a Temporal Surge put on himself, another Temporal Surge put on himself. That's when you get the problems. I think it's with the Cabal Ritual mechanics rather mm -hmm. than with anything else really in the army. Um, everything else functions in a very kind of appropriate way. But when you put the Cabal Rituals on top, that's when things start to get out of hand. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fair. Brian, your experience about playing against Seasons? Um, I think that... It's easy to look at the turn off armor saves and and say that it's overtuned and it should be something more akin to like a extra AP on your weapons or something along those lines. Um, but I think the scenarios where it where that is actually a difference is pretty limited. Mm -hmm. A lot of units that have really good armor saves also have you know four or five plus invuln saves and extra AP on all your weapons would put you in that space anyway. Wait. Um, okay, I'm gonna call you up. Name one. Every Terminator in the game. Yeah, but who's playing <laughs> Terminators? Okay, apart from Custodes, no one's really playing Terminators, right? You have okay. you have Custodes, you have Deathwing Knights. Um, like, what are the good targets when turn Rubric on Marines. Okay, Wraith there Knight, Wraith God, anything in Necrons almost, anything in Death Watch. Uh, but Necrons have, Necrons have the Fiona Pain, and, and also, like, Necrons, if you turned on the, uh, if, if you turned on, up the AP, say you were plus two AP instead, mm. would have the exact same effect as turning off your armor save. Right? Well, no, I mean, I mean, this I mean, is like things up, that have yeah. two up saves. Like what things that have a really good armor save where like an extra two AP um, would where where it would be different than just putting them onto their invuln save or turning off their armor save. And I think that's exactly Wraith Knights and like like some of the Eldar stuff, Wraith Guard. But that's stuff which is problems anyway, so you know, let's put those on trash. That's... Who cares, right? So beyond that, like I don't think it actually would have much of a change or an impact. So the obvious pivot would not actually change anything. Okay. Uh, I'd say that I used um Twist of Fate, so turning off the armor saves. Um maybe three or two times across the entirety of the WTC seven rounds. So right. it, it actually is not one of the extremely broken things um, in there. It was definitely double the double temporal surge is the single strongest thing in that book. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think double temporal surge is stronger for sure. But I just think that that turning off armor saves makes for a kind of feels bad scenario. Yeah, it, feels, I mean, it does it, feel bad. It definitely like... feels bad, but I guess I just don't think it has much of an impact in, in, in terms of the actual outcome of how the thing would go. So, like, for example, take a Flamer squad shooting at a Custody unit. Um, their Flamers are AP1. At right. AP2, the Custodies are put on their invuln save anyway. So you're 
for if that was nine cabal points plus one AP mm -hmm. at, at shoot that unit, nobody would be sitting there saying that was an unreasonable choice. Okay. And so let's take the same scenario. You shoot your ten five man flame units into two Karna fixes where you turn off the save and you probably kill both. So I, mean, I think there are, things, there are probably units. That there are plenty of things out there. Choice. But I think there's plenty of things out there that have. Mm, no I don't think I don't think there, there are plenty. I think that the I think that the typically the the comp like when you have a high armor save, you also have a supporting invuln save. Typically, not always, but typically. And the number of units where that's not true are pretty niche, and that those units um, are not common enough. Where I think that it's warrants changing this because it's too strong. Okay. You know, I don't think the argument that you kill Carnifex is really easily. Is enough of a reason to change, uh, you know, that cabal point mechanic, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, I kind of fix is just one example, but well, of course, but I just don't <laughs> right. think there are very many examples. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just not thinking about them all. But I mean, outside of the wraith guard, wraith knight kind of eldar hard target thing, marines and eldar, isn't it? But it, what? It but what yeah. can you play if that does exist? Though, is the question. Like, it, it actually doesn't come up that much, Dave. It's but like, does it genuinely... not come up because it, you it's... can't play that it, unit anyway because you could do that right no no it's because of the kind of ranges of things the fact that devastating wounds already goes through armor saves right the fact that stuff often does have a five up or a four up in one save mostly five ups um and it's also nine cabal points and for you to combine that stuff the points can get a little awkward you're much more likely to be you know activating the indirect fire stratagem or trying to do a doom bolt onto a little character and then temporal surging a couple of times, okay. uh, as much as you can, you're more likely to do those because those are stronger than the turning off armor saves, is what I found anyway. Okay, I'm going to concede to uh, concede <laughs> to your wisdom. Let us know down in the comments if you fucking hate that ability. Okay. I think everyone does, to be fair. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> but it's perfectly fair and balanced, is what I mean. <laughs> I'm going to get the angry lips <laughs> against you. <laughs> um, okay, that's kind of, that's T-Suns. Uh, what else we got down there? Custodies, I think, are in a pretty good spot, aren't they, realistically speaking? I'm, think, not, uh... a, I'm not a big fan of the fights first. I think that shuts off a lot of armies. Um, just how yeah, easily accessible it is, maybe. They're a bit too tuned against, the, against combat armies. They make... For example, I don't think orcs can beat them, um, you know, equal skill level like at all, um, and I think that's kind of a problem. No army should just be have a shutout against another army, um, and I think that's because of the fact that they have so much combat control. Hmm. Um, and it's not even combat control like there was in ninth edition. This is just I like, devastate you in combat before you ever have a chance to do anything. Hmm. Um, yeah. And so, so I, th I think there, there's some fixes of that. You know, they can they can look at the ability to do multiple strats on a turn. They could. Say that, it, that you can't do it with that stratagem. They could say um, only one change the stratagem to only one unit can be affected per phase. You know, there's lots of ways you can address that. And if they solve mm -hmm. the, as you said, fight first thing, then I think that custodies become probably perfectly fine. I think they're actually still they're one of the better armies, but I think they're not not overtuned. Yeah, or maybe that stratagem thing, like you can, you have to pick a stratagem before the game or something like that. And you can only use that one for free because um, like custodies have quite a few good ones there as well. Um, yeah, the, it does feel like everything just gets free stratagems. That's a bit weird. <laughs> like they made so much of the CP like lower, obviously, but then you get free stratagems. Like every single list plays units that can get free stratagems. I, I guess apart from Eldari, right? Um, which goes to show. Uh, Marines, I guess, I think over the moments should get nerfed. I think that Desolators prob... Uh, the problem here is that over the moments and Desolators is just the most boringest combination. Um, because you owe something, you indirect it, you've got, you're doing way more damage than you should have done otherwise, uh, because you're re-rolling all your small damage shots and you can make it AP1, for example. So I think something needs to be touched between Oath of Moments and Desolators. Again, Desolators. Um, I would like to see it be Oath of Moments, just because maybe you can only pick a unit that's like on an objective, for example, or maybe you can only uh, re-roll wounds against it, for example. Um, yeah, it does feel a little bit too good but at the same time if that were to change i would love to see them make some of the melee units in space marines a lot more viable because they don't really feel like they hit you know well enough right for the points investment that you're trying to get out of them i'd love to see the points or the see the melee units get better i think like one fix for for oath that could be pretty subtle um is you only get oath a moment if you can see the target oh yeah um nice and that only that only had a couple things and uh and one of those things is the actual problem right yeah yeah, and I mean, and Desolators in the current world are not too strong. It's just that I don't think the game players, that's where the game should be going, right? Like, 
I don't think it's a fun game to play. Uh, and I played Death Watch WTC. Um, but if Death Watch couldn't teleport your Desolators, it wouldn't be as strong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, anything on Marines, Vic? You probably just destroy them all every time you play. Everyone, uh, everyone hates Indirect Fire. That's the key thing. I would love to see a couple of changes still go through on that. Um, even though Indirect Fire is not playing a huge part in the meta at the moment, I think any kind of change that they can do to that is, is only going to be positive for the long-term health of the game. Yeah. Here's an uh, interesting one. Necrons. Do we think Necrons are OP? What's, uh, what's the story with them? I, th I think that Necrons have some pretty lame uh, gameplay mechanics to them. I think that the sheer unkillability of them doesn't lead for good gameplay experience for either player realistically right like it's quite an admin heavy um army especially with the fight phase being as it is currently designed i think, I think they to... nailed it i think they absolutely nailed necrons because they really? got them like kind of doing damage but not really a lot like these yeah. cool little characters attached to units and this horde which just keeps getting back up as you kill them mm -hmm. um i think it's really cool um is it going to be a little bit strong potentially it could be a really strong army but I don't think it'll ever be broken strong. They've kind of nailed it on the head, in my mm. opinion. Okay. It's, I guess it's different from GSC in that sense, where there's not that unsure ability where like, okay, you're getting back things that actually table me super fast, and they're kind of off the board, and they're on the board, and they're off the board, and it, I need to run around the board and everything. GSC whatever. just flat out hit too hard is the yeah. problem. If they were a horde of just like weird guys, just like popping up and playing the mission and stuff mm -hmm. and just trying to exist, then I love it. Awesome army. That's super cool. But they should not be able to kill you so effectively. Mm -hmm. I, like hate, Necrons, I hate Necrons. <laughs> um, I think that they are, they are one of the most frustrating armies in the game to play against uh, because when you shoot things, you want it to actually have an impact. You don't want your opponent to just gain models at the end of your activation. Um, so that's super frustrating and I hate it. Um, I mean, Dave can attest, uh, I don't, I don't get frustrated in games for, um, almost ever, but for some reason, Necrons are just like a, start chucking the salt all over the room. Um, but I, I think, um, I think they're maybe just a little bit too tuned with the reanimations, um, the out of, the out of sequence reanimations. I think mm -hmm. maybe that stratagem didn't allow you to use the reanimator or the ghost arc or stuff like that. You know, it, it just was what the stratagem says. I think that'd probably be fine. Um, but the fact that you can do that and then suddenly you get back half your unit or more, it just feels like you make no progress. And that's, uh, <laughs> that's frustrating. Yeah. And, and then obviously the, the transcendent Catan with uh, the four up feel no pain. I don't actually think that's a huge problem because, you know, it doesn't like table your opponent. Uh, it's strong, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't uh, fundamentally warp. Your opponent, I don't think, plays a lot differently because you have that, right? It's kind of like, this I can't a, really kill it. Hot take, but I think it's bad. <laughs> I, don't think it's, I don't think it's good. I think um, it just doesn't do anything. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's impossible to kill, but I don't think it really does anything. So yeah. I've, never, I've never been impressed with it. I've been impressed with it in some matchups, like against Custodes, for example, where you need something that can just get stuck in for five turns and then might kill a brick over three turns or four turns maybe or gum someone up in combat um he's an interesting one i think he's kind of fine for his balances uh and then there's one other thing i would like to see the damage if they were going to change reanimation i would like to see some of the damage increase on some of the units maybe no um, no i mean if they if they nerf the the survivability of the army uh, in that sense i would like to see them have maybe it, a it depends bit. on how how much they nerf it if they just kind of tweak it like i was saying i think that it's fine to keep the damage no. as it is. If they dramatically reduce it or 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 you know um, kneecap it, then then yeah, you got to start doing more damage because you're not going to be around long enough. Yeah, I but it's a careful balance between the two. It presents such a unique puzzle to solve because you have this army that's kind of existing and tough. You know which direction it's going to move because it's very linear in the way it plays, and it also doesn't do that much damage. So you start looking for these very creative solutions on how to actually win the game against something you know you often can't kill even if your whole army is shooting it hmm. and i think when you do find the solutions for that and i think the solutions are all very high skill solutions as well i think it's extremely rewarding as the opponent um yeah i understand the frustration but i would almost say that it's, it's one of the the coolest challenges you have in 10th edition is how you deal with necrons hmm. interesting on to the uh onto the big robots Small robots, no? <laughs> uh, Imperial Knights and CK. Do we just think that maybe towering is a good, you know, 
I guess let's substitute Imperial Knights and CK for the towering conversation. Uh, Brian being the uh, most towering model there is right now. <laughs> what what are your thoughts on towering? Um, you know, playing for and against it. Uh, I mean, there is no for. Uh, the 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 against is 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 sometimes in the game there are things which fundamentally break core tenets of what of of the rules that everyone else has to play by, and and those tend to be things which are wildly broken or so overcosted that they never get taken. Um, and towering is one of those rules. You know, when everyone else is fight playing a series of rules where they have to move around the board and experience terrain, and your model gets to ignore all of that, um, it fundamentally alters the way that the game gets played in a way that I don't think is healthy. So mm -hmm. I would like to see that changed in some kind of a way. I think towering should have an impact on the game, but I think that it should be um, one which is not fundamentally altering how the entire game gets played um rather maybe something within its local like the context around the model itself is is different like maybe it can see over terrain within a certain distance or something who knows right i mean there's there's a couple ways you could address that but just being able to have true line of sight across the entire board and and when when tournament organizers and um people have been playing since eighth and ninth and now tenth edition where where all terrain is quote-unquote infinitely high a lot of times and and the boards are purchased and designed with that intention, and then this rule comes in where it violates that kind of kind of promise that we've made. Um, it causes all kinds of problems. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I agree. I kind right. of like the I like the towering within twelve inch rule sort of thing. You know, like it can see with no obscurity than twelve inches. But I also would be a fan of it just going away completely. Just kill them. Kill no. Okay, look, I I feel bad for night players. Because they're in a position now where, again, the small knights are probably stronger than the big knights. Mm. And you rock up to your table with your 14, your 12 to 14 little knights. You have to be a special kind of unhappy to think that that's cool. I'm so sorry, my players. Because <laughs> I, I think that is unbelievably uncool and boring to turn up with that. Um, <laughs> but that's the only viable kind of route to go down competitively. And that's not even considering towering. And the issue is that if you make the big knights too good, they will end up being too good at shooting you, too good at punching you, and too hard to kill. Fundamentally, knights are one of those armies that has to be slightly weak to exist in a healthy way in the meta. Hmm. And uh, yeah, so I have no remorse. I think what they should do is um, above 2001 point, you can take knights as a standalone army. Otherwise, they're an ally. And I think everyone will be happier. I do like them as an ally option. I think that's really flavorful. I wish the allying options would open up a bit more in general. And, and they get stratagems as allies. That would be super cool. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Point them through the roof, like for that. But, you know, at, at least they would be flavorsome rather than an entire army of 14 little knights. What a stupid army. Yeah, I think you're completely right. Also, is that it, it's so much fun, more fun when you've got like two big knights and I don't know, six little ones or something like that, right? rather than just 14 small knights. You know, it feels much more like, a, okay, we're here to stat check each other kind of game uh, when it when it plays against that, which isn't a great uh, play experience as well. Um, so I think if the towering got changed, you could actually decrease the points on the big knights a little bit, I think, because uh, that would be quite a big nerf to them already. I would love to see the melee knights get a lot better. Like, just make their melee outrageous, you know? I, I, I don't know, because they just die from range most of the time anyway, right? Like, who's killing a big knight in melee, realistically speaking? Um, so, I would like to see it maybe have, like, it can activate and then... Oh, I can't believe I'm about to say this. <laughs> maybe it could activate and then it gets to fight twice, once per game or something like that if it clears a unit or something, right? Um, who knows? I, I feel like this solution is to keep the big knights in the game despite if we were to get rid of towering as well. The same Make time. it all bad. <laughs> <laughs> all right speaking of all bad we've got some armies that are quite poor some would say some armies that need a bit of a boost uh maybe let's pick one army each and uh um you know starting with brian what would you bring out of the gutter so to speak and how would you do it um uh the second part of that question is a lot harder than the first <laughs> um so i would I'd like to see Votan become more interesting. Um, and Votan, how you do it for Votan is really hard because being a newer army, they have 
a very limited number of data slates. Um, Voton are paying for the sins of their past right now, where they were just completely overtuned um, <laughs> and insane. Um, and also the the nature of kind of what that army wants to do and how it does it, um, kind of in terms of how you how you would build with its fluff, is is one that that encourages kind of eliteness, right? You know, they're 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 space dwarves. They're dwarves have never been an army, which is you know from even a, a fantasy perspective from this uh for an army which is meant to be kind of mass and hordes and lots of guys so just reducing points is not necessarily going to do it but you know looking at their list and the kind of their indexes they have very good strats they have great enhancements um their army rule could probably be be tuned a bit better um mm -hmm. it's some people it's say sketchy. some people say make them blister skill three on the board um, maybe I think that one of the problems you run into is, is when when an army is as a guy who played Tau a lot, ballistic skill four with access to plus one to hit is uh, sneakily res resilient. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the problems that they have is they don't have access to re rolls if I remember correctly that well, um, which makes you know even hitting on threes, um, you're missing a thirty three percent of all your attacks right, as opposed to kind of eleven percent when you start introducing re rolls, which is something Tau had back when that was the case. Um, or still is the case, in fact. Um, so I think reducing points, um, possibly the Blizzard skill, or just doing something about, you know, you have one grudge token this, two grudge tokens that, where as you stack, it starts to become more and more and more efficient at killing them um, in, a, in ways which are better than it currently is. Um, but I think that the only way you can really do it is is through points. Um, and, uh, oh, I just thought of the army I actually want to bring out, too. Um, go on, okay, go for it. Go for it. Uh, Har Harlequins. Yeah. <laughs> That's the army I really want to save because they are so bad. I was looking, I was desperately trying to find an army to play this weekend that wasn't Eldar because I just wanted to play something different. And I was like, oh, I'll play my Harlequin army that I got beautifully commissioned. Um, and I started looking through all their rules. And every time I would look at one of their rules, it would be the worst possible version of what it could be. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, well, maybe it's maybe it's at least two damage. Nope, it's one damage. Maybe it's at least AP two. No, nah, it's AP zero. Um, it's just <laughs> they're so so bad. Um, so I'd like to see even just something that makes them feel like an all Harlequin army feel like a Harlequin army. Um, I just that's that's what I'd like to see. So I think a detachment. Maybe that'll come out the auto codex. An auto detachment that. Is Harlequins that does something interesting for them, um, and then maybe you know it's possible that their damage is kind of hidden below some layers, and once you start to get to it, it'll become more interesting. But it certainly was hard to find when I was looking at it. Yeah, they uh, they got the short end of the stick, that's for sure. They lost the codex. <laughs> they got cut <laughs> after that. Although they were extremely uh, strong, dominant, in fact, in the, almost the entirety of Ninth Edition, weren't they? So. Mm -hmm. One might argue that they deserve the naughty corner for a change. Vic, what about yourself? So I'm going to pick Sisters. Oh, nice. It's, and I, I'm only going to pick one point with Sisters. Now, and it's a, it's a game-wide point on how they differentiated what certain weapons can do to certain profiles. Mm -hmm. And they kind of, with the plasma gun, they were like, look, plasma guns are good into everything. Mm -hmm. So let's make all the vehicles a little bit tougher. So the plasma guns are wounding on fives. Mm -hmm. And then when I was reading the preview and that was like, cool, awesome. So that means Melter Guns are going to be strength 12, right? Mm. And Melter Guns are just set at strength 8 or 9. And I feel like Sisters really suffer from this because they're wounding vehicles on 5s with their anti-vehicle weaponry. Mm. Their Melter Guns have become anti-infantry Melter Guns. It's, it's really awkward. Um, so I would love to see kind of like a wider change to Melter weaponry. Or even just sisters having access to slightly stronger melter weaponry, or mm -hmm. a stratagem which improves their melter weaponry, just so that they have a direct anti-tank, anti-monster output option. Mm -hmm. like a plus one a wound or reroll wounds would be kind of kind of nice. Yeah, or way. or anti-vehicle two plus, you know, on a multi melter. Well, I would yeah. love that. Mm -hmm. I don't know, two plus has been much, but sure. Three plus, three plus. <laughs> three plus. <laughs> I think that's a good point. I think a lot of people probably agree with you on the melter front there. What does it melt? Well, it melts the exact same stuff that plasma melts. So why would you play Melter? Mm. Um, and it no longer melts the things it's meant to melt. Mm. I think that's that's a design space problem where, where Games Workshop really wanted Melter not to be this kind of universal answer to all vehicles. But sisters have f f histor historically and because of their fluff have 
that's what they use as the holy trinity right so mm. so you know you've kind of designed yourself into a space where oh well this army just doesn't get to play versus tanks that well mm. yeah it, i mean they got last cannons right because they put, put it as strength 12 but there's no reason a multi-motor couldn't be the same strength like how it was before uh i think that the problem with that is that you then you have things like devastators would never take Last cannons, you would never take missile launchers. You would only take multi because they're just objectively better. But with shorter okay. range, right? Yeah, but that's not... I mean, look at 9th edition. That's true in 9th edition as well. Um, and nobody ever took last cannons, right? Because multi melters were just objectively better almost in every situation. So I'm okay with the way that they've done it, where they've made multi melters a lower strength, and they're not actually... Like, if you get the damage through on a vehicle, that's great, but it's not guaranteed to do it like, say, a last cannon is, or designed to do it like a last cannon is. But I think sisters should have some kind of a way to turn their multi meltas into the anti-tank that they used to be. And I think that the idea of a stratagem, like you said, Vic, is uh, is a good way of doing that. Something that just kind of, just tip it up a bit, whether it's yeah. plus on the wound or reroll wound. Anti-vehicle too. Anti-vehicle. <laughs> yeah, anything like that. You know, I mean, maybe, maybe anti-vehicle uh, 7 plus or something, you know. Just, <laughs> but I, th I think that's the way to do it. Because that way, multi are are good for the because the weapons used everywhere, right? You can't really have a or have a call to sisters of like a uh, adeptus ministorum multi melt and have it be higher strength or something. You can see that too. Oh, here's yeah. a here's a curveball. I just thought of what if melt what if melter profiles got stronger the closer you were to your target. Like if you just if you measure it out, I don't know, it goes up to plus four, and if you're within I don't know four inches, then you get plus four or, or something like that. You know, like. That'd be kind of cool, you know. You like yeah. measure your measure it like it would I mean, be a wooden charge range or something. They do kind of get more powerful the closer you are. That's that is the melter rule. That, they do more yeah, damage. Yeah, granted, but I mean more powerful than strength, uh, so oh. you know, kind of cut through a bit more. I don't know. Yeah, I think melter is a bit of a sad spot in overall. Yeah, it's tough. I would, uh, I would. Uh, oh God. Um, yeah, one day. What's yeah, uh, Admic are obviously hilariously bad. Uh, they are just awful, man. Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Far out. Do they have the worst army detachment rule? The the battle oh, the, the uh, rat no, storm thing. One. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty non influential. Yeah, in fact, it's actually it's actually worse against some armies like demons. It's mm -hmm. bad against or necrons. It's, it's literally bad against. Interestingly, uh, bad against sisters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, plus one to hit. <laughs> uh, Admic are really really awful. Uh, they have the you know i guess i could be the worst attachment rule some of this stuff is just pointed just ridiculously high like disintegrators are high they only have they have so many rules interactions that are just make their units worse when you include them like i think the classic one here is that you include an infantry unit with your um castellan robots and then you get hit by anti-infantry guns <laughs> so your tanky castellan robots just get wounded uh it's a bit fringe that one but it's nonetheless, it's it's a bit uh, a bit sad. They have some cool units too, like Castellan robots, and I think uh, Balistari are kind of cool. You know, Rust Stalkers and that. Even the mm -hmm. Rangers are quite cool, really. Uh, Balistari's call is quite cool. Um, so I would love to see them get. Uh, I mean, geez, you could probably play twenty four hundred points of that army and still be you know competing. Um, but then everyone would probably just spam even more breaches. So hopefully they maybe tune down some of the things that people only play like breaches and then they make the rest of the codex a lot more accessible by just in decreasing the points on those things i think would be nice um because i think the army rule is quite cool the one where you need to you know you get plus damage if you're playing aggressive or you can get you know more defensive buff army wide i think it's quite a cool game mechanic um to go into so yeah yeah awesome. i don't think we're going to be seeing them dominating the tables anytime soon and you can quote me on that one uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think like we've done a really wide range of stuff. We've discussed lots of topics there. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how many of those things are kind of on the correct line of what GW do. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe maybe we should call it there, Dave. And then uh, on the next episode, we can kind of go into some of our LGT prep as we get closer to it. There we go. Next episode, LGT prep and... I take it the big boogeyman codex is going to be out by then potentially, or we might have Ooh, we might have yes. parts of it. The Tyranid Codex, which it's going to be interesting to see how they do it because it'll be the first codex in a sea of indexes. So, you know, you can have six your detachments there. You know, who knows, right? I mean, I just want Crusher I... Stampede to be terrible. I want it to be the worst <laughs> detachment they've ever printed. I don't care if the other ones are busted. I just want Crusher Stampede to be awful. Yes, that's fair. 
Uh, but we'll see what it comes to it. So we'll see you then when uh, when that comes out. We'll be talking about the LGT meta, I guess, probably after the data slate. Hopefully, we'll have the data slate soon. So we'll probably be doing an episode covering that. This has been The Wishlist. We've had Brian Seip from Team Ignite on with us. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. Bit of a uh, bit of a splash all on this one. And uh, look, if, I think if Games Workshop, uh, you know, adopts every single one of these changes, uh, you know, it would be... <laughs> <laughs> it would be great they can, they can uh, send us the check in the mail <laughs> and get rid of that bloody turn of armor <laughs> <I'm sick> of <laughs> that. thank you thank you for joining us brian and uh, see you all next time by the fireside thank you for listening to the 40k fireside podcast vic and i hope you've enjoyed listening and we greatly appreciate any feedback that you can provide after the show 